make a pretty bold statement to tell you that he is the most balanced and most intelligent cattleman I have ever met. And that's and if you think about those people that have really impacted your life, they're, they're pretty special to you. And Charlie Will's exceptionally <laughs> special to me. I, I had the pleasure of working uh, uh, across the hallway from Charlie when I was working in the sire department at Select Sires a few years ago. And to tell you a little story about Charlie is that he started, like a lot of folks, in a cow, in a cow production system on a, on a small dairy in southern Illinois, went to University of Illinois because he couldn't afford gas money to go another hour and a half to Purdue, and graduated from there and became a semen salesman. He worked in western Indiana, cash bottoming was one of his customers um, in, in, the dairy, in the dairy realm. He was selected by Select Sires to move up the chain because he had the incredible ability to understand phenotype. He helped create a great system called Select Mating Service where they went out and visually appraised dairy cows and helped consult on which animals to use. From there, he moved on up to be a Holstein sire analyst for Select Sires and then head of the sire department. Charlie was at Select for about 40 years. Charlie's pretty remarkable because if you, if you know about Madison or the World Dairy Expo, the females that have dominated those shows over the years, you can about guarantee they're out of the bull that Charlie selected. Great dairy cows are out of bulls that Charlie selected. If you think about in the dairy industry, the TPI or what we call API index, the great cows in that breed are out of bulls Charlie selected. He used to acquire about 300 Holsteins a year for select sires, and his call bulls, the ones that he didn't need anymore, are the greatest bulls today walking in uh, the Middle East, like in Iran. They bought his call bulls. So Charlie has been able to adapt as the industry has changed over the last 40 years. He understands all aspects of the registered cattle business and the commercial cattle business. And I think he can teach us a lot today about uh, his tenure at Select Sires. Charlie, thank you. Thank you, Luke. That was the best paid political announcement I've ever heard. I know I truly enjoyed working with Luke when he was at Select Sires. I loved his enthusiasm, his passion to learn, his passion for your industry, and the eagerness to learn. He would plop into my office periodically and sit down and say, what new do you know? What do I need to know? He wasn't afraid to ask. And I respect and appreciate that and admire you yet today, young man. Dr. Pollock mentioned another great Select Sires guy. Any of you know Roy Wallace? He was a hell of a man, wasn't he? And he had the same passion and enthusiasm for your industry that Luke had. I truly admired him as a great friend, and I learned a lot from him when I was a junior sire analyst. The best thing I learned from him, he said, listen to your producers. They will tell you what they need and what they want. Don't try to tell them what they should use or want. And that really helped me in the rest of my career. Congratulations on your 50th year. You're getting bigger and you're getting better. I can tell that by the turnout of this crowd. Last night was an amazing evening. Great atmosphere, beautiful facility, and I congratulate you. Luke called me, asked me if I'd be willing to talk a little bit about how genomics has affected the dairy side of it. I said, absolutely yes. It all kind of started back in the late 90s. When USDA, a couple of researchers, came to the five major AI studies and said, hey, we have an idea. You know, they're going to sequence the bovine genome and we can maybe learn something from that. Maybe find some genetic markers. Would you be willing, us, willing to send us the DNA on your proven bulls and build a database? I said, sure. Well, little did we know we had to send semen on all of our proven bulls and our great bulls of the past, and we had to pay you to give us your, for us to give you the data to genomic testing to run the SNPs. So we gave them the DNA, paid to have it analyzed, and they built their database of proven sires. About 2006, they start seeing, thinking they're coming up with some uh, markers. 2007, 
They announced they've identified some very significant markers and the plan to have their first genomic evaluation release in 2008, 10 years ago. Man, time flies. So our team at Select got together and thought, we need to know more. We need to find out if this thing's going to be real or not. So four of us from the Dairy Sire Department and Dave Thorbaugh, general manager of Select, got in a plane, we flew to USDA and met with them to ask them a bunch of questions. They have four or five research scientists that were very much involved. Little did we know when we got there, they had our whole program set up. And all the first speakers came from the human genome side. We thought, what the heck's going on here? But everything we learned in bovine, we've learned through the human genome. And they started getting up and they started talking about this all started in infertility clinics. Couples want to have children. They want to do IVF. They got these embryos. And they want to know more, as you learn more about genetics and the genes, well, I want to have a boy. I want to have a girl. I want a blonde, blue-eyed girl. As the time goes on, they learn, he says, well, in our family tree, we have a recessive genes. MS. We want a baby, but we don't want them to carry that gene. We can do that. One thing led to another, which led to another, which led to another. And they went so far as we started asking more and more questions, and they actually said, in the future, we will actually be able to estimate that embryo intelligence, athletic ability. And we went, holy shit. <laughs> That's, they can learn that eventually through the human genome, genome. We can learn a lot through the bovine genome. And we went back and we gunned up. We geared up. We geared up big time. We wanted a genomic test as many bull calves on the farm with good parent average as we possibly could. Many of the key female lines that we were working with, we need to know, we need to know what the differences are going to look like. So we were very, very aggressive at the very, very beginning. I talk to the dairy customers, I say, you believe in genetics in the cornfield, don't you? Do you believe there's any difference from one hybrid to another? Any one number from the number? They all shake their heads, yes. Well, the same thing happens in the barn. Genetics differences in the barn. I don't care if you have a 50 cow herd or a 5,000 cow dairy herd. I'll ask the dairy They have two things in common. Any guess what those might be? Whether you have a 50 cow herd or a 5,000 cow herd. Every one of those has their top cows and their bottom cows. And the same management, that's the genetic difference. Do you want more of the better cows in your herd? You can do that. We've made tremendous progress in milk production over the years through selection and better management. All time high of total milk yield, all time low of cow numbers in the US. That's efficiencies. Feeding the population and being more efficient at it. Our breeding values have continued to go up, and obviously the sires lead the cows because the semen gets used, and three years later the cows are in milk. And USDA showed how much progress, genetic progress, has been made since 1957. This is for fat yield. And ironically, about 28% of the production gains have come from better management, improved management and about the same amount from genetic. But here lies the difference. You extrapolate those curves. Management will continue to improve, but not at a steep rate. But the genetic difference going forward, you extrapolate that curve, has gone up tremendously. And the dairies in the U.S., particularly the bigger commercial ones, I've identified this now, 
My greatest gains are not going to be so much how I can change my management, my nutrition, my buildings, my airflow, my feeds. It's going to be how much can I change my genetics. And now genetics is not only a com not just a commodity anymore. Now you it has they realize that it has real value as a management tool as well. This is the genetic merit of the actively marketed Holstein bulls since 2000. Look at the chunk of gain since 2010. Average genetic merit per year. That steep curve is climbing faster than ever before. The amount of genetic progress happening in Holstein today is at an inherited rate, certainly by far more than in any time of my career. Here's a thousand cow herd in Wisconsin, genomic tested all the cows. You look at the top quartile of cows for milk, second quartile, third quartile, and fourth quartile. The difference between the top quartile of 248 cows in that herd for ME milk, 305 milk, and the bottom quartile was almost 1,900 pounds of milk. They all get fed the same, they all get housed the same, they all have to go through the milking parlor the same, which cow is going to make you the money? That top quartile cow. Do you want more of those? You can do that. You can build them. You can breed them. That's real. And that's just one trait. When I started back in the very beginning, the greatest bull in the breed at the time was a bull called, slick sire bull called Round Oak Elevation. Round Oak Reg Apple Elevation. He put us on the map. He was way ahead of his time for both production and type traits at the same time. Today, even today, this bull has more genes in common than any bull in the Holstein breed. Even today. But back then, what do we have to market them on? A proven bull? Milk proof, fat proof, protein proof, and type. That was it. Those are the tools you had to work with to make your progress. And today, we have 70, we have six production traits, 15 type traits, five type fitness traits, five type traits, 18 linear traits, eight selection index, 19 reliabilities, 71 total, and more to come. And a lot more traits to look at. We have three official genetic evaluation releases each year, one in April, one in August, one in December. We have weekly genomic releases, but those weeklies only include animals with their first time genomic results. And one of the reasons we, they, they're at three times a year, not four, no five, or anything like that, several reasons. One is it takes them almost one month, the data set is so large, to edit the data before run, run the data, proof the data before they release the data. And you think about it, you know, some of us one would like to have, like, like the stock market, daily results, but it's just like the stock market. If you do that, you have knee-jerk reaction. And when you come to a breeding philosophy, you do not need a knee-jerk reaction. You need to be able to plan ahead and work ahead. If things change too constantly, the breeders lose faith. And you really don't know what direction you're going in your breeding philosophy. But we have PTAs for all the type traits. There's 18 in linears. And genetics is more powerful than ever. We have changed the Holstein cap. Dramatically. If you can breed a cow to make her better, you can breed a herd of cows to make them better. We have built a beautiful cow. Cow gives more milk than ever before from a shallower, more beautiful udder than ever before. More balanced, more attractive, better butterfat, better protein. We built a better cow that you can see. 
but now we need to build a cow and improve her on the traits that you cannot see and make her even better. Her cow fertility, her calvability, her somatic cellular mastitis, her resistance to health diseases. We can do that. Now we have the tools to do that. If you can measure a trait, you can make progress selecting for it. Starting back in 1926, we started our first milk and fat yield pro, uh, proofs at USDA. Added in 78 type traits, linears. Protein, productive life, our longevity trait was at first established in 1994. Somatic cell utter, uh, utter health in 94. Calving ease, dystocia in 2000. 2003 daughter pregnancy rate trait was devised. Remember that year. What year? Stillbirth in 2006. Bull conception rate. Cow and heifer conception rates. Cow livability. Gestation length. Cow health just introduced in 2018. PTAs for ketosis, metritis, milk fever, retained placenta, displaced ablamacin, and probably soon to come, resistance to heel warts. Differentiate mastitis types so you can better treat. Some are more costly than others. Feed efficiency, heat tolerance, and I'm sure many, many more to come. You have so many tools in your toolbox today. You can pick and choose those that are important to you and better fit your management scheme and your breeding program. Focus on those traits. Your look, terminology is not that different. Our PTAs are your EPDs. Our reliabilities are your accuracies. We have several total, uh, multiple total indexes. We have grazing index, cheese merit index, fluid milk index. But the two that really most breeders look at are TPI and net merit, just like your two total indexes are API and TI. When you look at TPI and net merit, the difference is TPI gives a little bit more weight to udder traits and feet and leg traits and body traits, whereas net merit puts very little emphasis on those and really homes in primarily on the health traits. So a breeder can choose what's important to him. Those that are looking at breeding stock probably look at TPI. A pure commercial herd, some of those may look more at net merit. Holstein Association and the breed associations do their individual type proofs. USDA, which is now CDBC, moved to CDBC, does the net merit dollar indexes, the production proofs, and the fitness trait proofs. And there are six DHIA processing centers that send data to CDBC. And you say, why, what is CDBC? That's Council of Dairy Cattle Breeding. Because what happened was, we want to do fitness traits. And USDA was all doing all the genetic evaluations. So they wanted all the DRPCs to send their fitness trait data, their treatment data from their farms to USDA to start calculating, estimate some values for fitness traits. But then the processing centers and dairymen say, whoa, you put that at USDA, it is in the public domain. And I can ask for that data. And I will know what you are using for treatment, what you're treating for, how you're using it, how you're abusing it, say the animal rights people. So everything came to a strict halt. How do we be, how do we figure this out? So the decision was to USDA to continue to do all the research but move all the collection data and create a new organization called CDBC, Council of Dairy Cattle Breeding, will collect all the data from the processing centers, including the fitness trade data. That way nobody can go to Washington and say, USDA, your office, and say, hey, we want that data. 
Now they don't have access, and dairymen are more free to sign in the form of release this data so we can do genetic evaluations. That was huge, big next step. Genetic bases every five years, we're currently from 2015, 2020 will be the next one. And we love total indexes, I love, like total indexes, because there's so many data to look at. But I think you pick your total index to find a group of animals to work with. And from within that, pick and choose the ones that best fit your breeding and management scheme. We have gotten totally carried away in our industry on rank. And everybody wants to use number one. But the more number one gets used, the less number two, number three gets used. Number four, number 10, number 20, number 30. And all of a sudden, the narrowing of the genetic base, you have less variation in pedigrees, and you create your own little monster, and that's what's happened. These are how the weights are broken down that go contribute into the major indexes. And as new traits, and also if you have too much of one thing and you narrow the genetic base and you don't have enough pedigree difference, very sire differences, and new economic traits become important, you may have lost some genes that you could have used. An example before genomics. There was a bull by one of our competitors. It was the number one TPI bull in the breed. With a lot of data. Thousands of dollars. He's reliable, 99%. Big time production, big time type bull. Everybody wanted him in your pedigrees. Even us. We didn't know then, until the, marker, the evaluation traits were determined later. But we started noticing there have been complaining, second lactation, or third. These cows don't breed back. They are infertile. And all of a sudden, everybody ran away from him in the pedigree because they know how infertile they were. Things change. If you go 100 mile one way, you might be going the wrong way. So you need to have variation so you have genes to select for as trait importance change. The net merit formula has changed over the time as new traits come on board and become economically relevant, they change the weights and change the formula and does some re-ranking, tweaks it. So the night and 2000, matter of fact, this year, I don't have an updated slide since I'm retired. <laughs> they just changed the net merit formula again and they added some of the newer fitness traits that they just introduced here this year. Likewise, the TPI formula at Holstein has changed over the years. In 2017 was the last TPI change. My guess is 2019, they're gonna update it with some of the new fitness traits as well to change it. So the total index changes as economics and new traits dictate. Genomic pedigree. Genomics has really helped us correct parentage errors. As herd sizes got bigger and bigger and bigger in the U.S. dairies, we noticed there was a higher parentage error rate as we did random blood typing. You know, they got these calving pens with 15, 20 heifers or cows in there. You just assume the cow licking that calf is theirs. And that's how it gets recorded. We were running nationally about a 16% parentage error rate. You know what's worse than no data going into the system? Bad data. And we learned early on, because of that parentage error, the best bulls were underestimated. Because if you took their parentage error daughters out of, they expressed the difference even greater. It was the random animals that were regressing the best ones. And now with genomics, when that data comes in and it finds a parentage error, that animal is not used in the genetic evaluation until they correct the parentage error. And 
it's amazing the power of the DNA. And all your scientists earlier today could tell you about it. But you could send in a hair sample from anywhere in the world on something. A Holstein. And if that parents were genomic tested, they'll tell you exactly who out of the millions is the parent. That's the power of that DNA. That's the power of that DNA. When 2008, the first genetic evaluations came out, there were 2,500 proven bulls in the predictor group. 2,500 proven bulls in the predictor group. And it has really grown since then. And at that time, Eurogenomics in Europe, there were four of the major countries over there that band together, created their own system, had a far bigger reference population than we had. And we were concerned that they were going to have a genetic edge. So everyone, all the studs are very, very aggressive testing in the U.S., trying to learn more and gain more. And it grew in 2010 to 10,000. In December of 2011, we included SNPs. We did a trade with SNPs from the Eurogenomics group. That jumped to 17,000 postings. 2014, we're up to 26,000. You notice in Jersey's, and August 14th, they took some uh, European sires and jumped their reference sire population. And the one that gained the most was Brown Swiss. They were really struggling down here, and they used the Euro uh, European one, which is a much bigger Brown Swiss population, and made gigantic gains in genetic knowledge in their reference sire population. So at that time, 20, August of 14, we had 116,000 animals in the Holstein reference sire population, reference population. August 2017, we're up to over 37,000 proven sires. Now we also have evaluations for Guernseys. So these are the breeds that have to have a lot to learn. And you're going to have much smaller reference sire populations, much lower reliabilities, and obviously greater margin of error. But you got to start somewhere. Jersey continues to gain, Brown Swiss gained dramatically with the European sires. And this looked at the correlation for milk product, parent average in December of 13, the data predicting milk yield and the actual daughter yield deviation in August 17. Predicting beforehand, looking at the actual results. Parent average, the correlation is 0.57. The genomic adjusted parent average is now 0.78. Adding that genomic data to the parent, original parent average doubled our power, our knowledge, and our accuracies. Likewise with jerseys, tremendous gains as well. And the number of bulls that are compared from before proofs to after daughter data yield, yield the actual yield deviation came in. Would anybody here go, care to go to the slot machines with a 77% chance of winning? <laughs> Give me your money. I'll, I'd like to try to do that tomorrow <laughs> if I could. But genotypes now are abundant. It has exploded. And what happens when you get more data? You get more knowledge. When you get more knowledge, you get better at what you do. And you can start finding that needle in the haystack. And it's the power of data that finds the fitness traits. You know, so many times people talk about high heritability traits, low heritability traits. They're heritable traits. The difference is the high heritability ones, you can figure those out pretty easily with a limited amount of data. 
The low heritability traits are just as important, but it takes a lot of data to get the noise out of it to figure out what you can actually predict is genetically heritable. That's the bottom line. That's the bottom line. And you can imagine the number of females that now are being tested as unbelievable. And now, as, as Rajiv um, talked about imputing, once you have solved a lot of the equations in sire lines and cow lines, now you can actually impute some blank spots based on their relatives. That's been huge. Huge. And this is where we've gained the biggest advantage over the Europeans. Now when I go to Europe and do the presentations over there, they want to know what their animals, they send their samples here because they want to know what they're going to look like on the U.S. system because they have not had the same level of faith and confidence because our reference population is blown by theirs. Why? Because there the AI studs controlled all testing. They did not release the results back to the producer. They only said they're good enough or not good enough for them to work with. That's it. They had no incentive. You left the producer no incentive. Why to should I test? Now in the U.S., there's incentive. They can build their own breeding herd. They can see the data. They can market with that data. They can sell embryos with that data. They can sell bulls with that data. And now better than, more importantly than ever before, our large herds have become believers and management tool. An example, there are a lot of large commercial dairies now. You know, across the U.S., we've done a much better job in fitness traits, in fertility, in longevity, sex semen, Everybody's got excess replacements. Big herds. You still we have to buy, 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 buy to keep animals in the herd, keep the herd at capacity, none of them anymore. They got all they want. And then some. What do they do? They'll genomic test all their heifers. They'll find some based on the genomics they ain't worth raising. Call them. And then they're going to take the rest of the genomic efforts, rank them, take that top core top, and they're going to breed them to the best genomic sex semen they can get. The next two quartiles, they're going to breed them to the best traditional genomic or proven bulls they can get. And the bottom quartile, they're going to use beef bulls. <coughs> has really helped our beef sales at Select Sires. And what's going to happen? A larger share of their heifer crap every year is going to be from their best genetics. They're going to raise a more efficient heifer, a more profitable cow, and a bigger payback. And we're glad they're using the bottom quartile beef. Why? Because remember, production is going like this. In the U.S. continues and going up faster per cow. You know what's happened to our milk price? It's going to the toilet. It's going in the toilet. So we have to balance cow numbers. We got to get that population to where to meet the production needs. We're not like other companies and businesses. You got something that's not selling, you stop producing, right? Change. What does dairymen do? When milk price is high, they milk more cows. When milk price is low, what do they do? Milk more cows. <laughs> we gotta get past this mindset. You can't make more, generate more income, you gotta figure out how to lower your cost. And that's finally sinking in in the commercial dairymen. And now they're seeing the value of genetics and the value of genomics and helping them in their management of this and it's actually helping them in their breeding programs why because if you genotype your heifers and all the bulls are genotyped already 
You can have a mating program that will mate those individuals for their strengths, minimize their weaknesses, and minimize <coughs> inbreeding at the same time. Automate the whole system. Make the fastest, best genetic gain, minimize inbreeding, and improve your overall quality of herd. And I see this has continued to escalate, and the Europeans are far behind us just because their database has not grown nearly as fast as it, as it needed to. And now the U.S. system is the gold standard around the world. And now most of all the European sons and most of the other countries are the bees using the best genomic bulls they can from the U.S. for their seed stock for their next generation. So as of today, we have 41,000 proven bulls in our Holstein preference pred a predictor group. And that group population continues to grow. <coughs> and the other breeds, they're sure Guernsey are growing. They're growing slowly, but they're growing. And they're starting to have more confidence as well. Reliability. So genomics has helped bulls and genetics at all level of their stage of their careers. Before Genomics, these were the reliabilities we were getting for parent average, for milk, fat, protein, somatic cell, daughter pregnancy rate, productive life, sire calving ease, daughter calving ease, utter composite, foot leg composite, and type. You were wrong as often as you were right. In August of 2017, this particular group, when you added their genomic data, look at the jump in reliabilities. Now we're getting reliabilities on two-month-old bulls, what well, we used to get on a proven bull with 50 milking daughters and 50 milking in herds. Wow. And the big value of genomics is screening the calves that come into AI and eliminating the calves that should not. Remember that bull I talked about that was number one in the breed with big milk, big type? Everybody wanted it, and later nobody wanted it because of DPR. Those kind of bulls are eliminated now in the population. We screen every calf. If it's a bad DPR calf, it never gets on the trailer. If it's a bad difficulty calf, it never gets on the trailer. If it's a horrible somatic cell calf, it never gets on the trailer. So the quality of genetics to come in that go to the marketplace screens out the disasters. So we don't replicate that in the future. And now a first crop proven bull with only 100 daughters and 100 herds with the genomic data. Look at the reliabilities. We make less mistakes. Less of this two steps forward and three steps back. You're always advancing. That's the key to genetic progress, always advancing. But the reliabilities we're getting now even on fitness traits. Daughter pregnancy rate. Man, just 100 daughters and 100 herds. Before genomics, that was less than 50. Now you can have confidence in the breeding program and the selections that you're making. Priority one, get her pregnant. Remember that chart where we were getting milk, milk per, uh, selection was going like this? Man, we were making gains making milk. But at the same time, we didn't know it, our cow fertility was going like this. Wrong direction. Now we had all this cows that wanted to milk but would not breed back. What year did I say daughter pregnancy rate came on board? God, you guys got good memories. Right about here. Remember I said if you can measure a trait, you can select for it and you make progress. And we turn the curve. We turn the curve. Our breeding values have now started to work in our way up for daughter pregnancy rate. And dramatically improved since 2009. I haven't got this chart updated. We also have heifer conception rate and cow conception rate, and the bulls lead the cows. And look how much further the bulls and cow bulls are now 
than the females of cow conception rate and heifer rate. That is a prediction of what fertility is yet to come. Still tremendous gains going to happen in the dairy herd. We can have our cake and eat it too. We can make them milk more. We can uh, get them to breed back. You've got to pay attention to the traits that do that. And this is progress from 2002 to 2012. Tremendous progress. This is a 5,600 cow dairy in Nevada. Cor genomic tested all the animals in the herd. Broke them in quartiles. This is the top quartile for genomic DPR, daughter pregnancy rate. This is the preg rate of that group of cows, 31. This is the bottom quartile of daughter pregnancy rate, average minus 1.7. This is the preg rate. Do you think that dairyman saw any economic return about eliminating that bottom quartile? He was probably talking about millions of dollars. Now they see, now they believe. And they have buy-in. When you have buy-in, it will continue to get this engine steamed up and this engine rolling going forward. This is a rude and crude thing I used a few years ago. I looked at daughter pregnancy rate and you look at bulls that are high on daughter pregnancy rate and bulls that are low on daughter pregnancy rate and the traits that predict it. Look at those traits in red. It said, Lower somatic cell will help your daughter pregnancy rate. Lower dairy form, not skinny cows. Cows that burn off all their body weight dairy cows don't breed back. What are the major traits? Sire calving ease, stillbirth, daughter calving ease, daughter stillbirth. Those were the great predictors of DPR. So dairymen look at those traits and they prioritize them and they are an important part of daughter pregnancy rate, predicting daughter pregnancy rate. Calving ease, huge driver in the dairy market in our semen sales, huge driver. In our area, low number is better. I think your area, high number is better, right? So in the dairy, you want a six, seven percent calving ease means six or seven percent assisted Calving. So the lower the number, the better. If you can get a 5, 6, 7, that's awesome. If you get a 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, that's not good. And we've continued to manage sire calving ease, and now through genetics, we're lowering the daughter difficulty. Now we're breeding a female that delivers a better cow, easier calf. Productive life, we've struggled. We've pushed the cow so hard and basically got her to work harder than her body could hold herself together. And management couldn't keep up with what the genetics was making that cow do, particularly when they were on BST. But now we've turned the curve and making genetic progress in both good production traits but positive lifetime traits. Here's a thousand cow herd in Wisconsin that genomic tested all their cows. And they looked at the top quartile of the herd, 264 cows for productive life, and their bottom 25% of their cows for productive life, or 370. And look at the health incidences between the top quartile cows in that herd and the bottom. Huge. What did I say a while ago? If you can't increase your income, you got to what? Decrease your cost. That's going to affect your net bottom line. And dairy, dairies have bought into this. They have bought into this. You have to use all your management knowledge and traits you can possibly do to lower your cost and your health events, but you can also do it by genetic selection even on low heritability traits, if you have the data. Data is the power and data is knowledge. Rooting cost is the quickest way to improve the bottom line today's dairies. 
kind of a quick and dirty, same thing on productive life. I looked at bulls with high productive life and bulls that with low productive life. What are the predictors that kept them in the herd? Low somatic cell. Calving traits, huge. Dairy farm, huge. Don't let them get too skinny. Stature. Don't get them to look too tall. Tall makes clumsy cows. I tell dairies this, I said that. I'm a huge believer in dairy strength, but people don't know it because it's not an index. It makes common sense though. We're kind of like the automobile industry, building the cars. We kept making them bigger and bigger. Like the S first time, first year the SUVs came out, sports utility available. They had one big problem. What was that? Rollovers. How they solve that? Widen the wheelbase. Same thing with a cow. If you're going to make her bigger, you got to widen her wheelbase. Now she's, you change that center of gravity, that center of gravity, and she's not functional anymore. Common sense. Common sense. Skinny cows are my pet peeve. I hate skinny dairy cows. They are basically, I'm on a medical emergency. You got to help me live. I ain't going to do it on my own. I'm high maintenance. High cost. And what's that going to do to my bottom line? Lower my bottom line. Another thing you learn, we learn. When cows start losing all their body weight, there's also something called the digital cushion. That's that fatty tissue just above the hoof and an axic cushion. And when they lose their body weight, one of the last thing they lose is they lose all that fat in that digital cushion. And then you have bone on bone, and then what happens? And they can't walk, they don't go to the feed bunk, they don't eat as much, they don't milk as much. And you know what a cow does when she's in heat and she's got sore feet? She lays down because she hurts too much to tell you I'm in heat and you need to breathe me. It affects DPR, it affects longevity, it affects cost of doing business. All these things are interrelated, intertwined. <laughs> Big question all, early, early on, proven bulls or genomic bulls? Some only wanted to use proven bulls, some only want to use genomic bulls, some want to use a little bit of less. And the answer has to come from within. What's your comfort zone? What's your comfort zone? So bull proofs do change over time. So you look at the top 100 merit proven bulls in December of 2014, and now you look at their August proofs to see how much they've changed. Proven bulls to proven bulls, but with thousands more dollars and changes of TPI formulas or net merit formulas. The average change was only 46 net merit dollars on that top 100 but a pretty good range and spread. Some went up, some still went down. The top 100 gen active genomic bulls in December 2014 now have their daughter data proof. The average change is minus 70 net merit. Bigger changes up, bigger changes down. But still far less than what we had before we ever had genomics. So there's still risk of change in movement. That's why you can even continue to use more bulls of the top 100, not just number one bull, or number two, or number three. Diversify your use. Same thing held true with jerseys. Obviously a bigger spread, just because they don't have the reliabilities and accuracies as we do, and we do in the Holsteins. And this is probably a mirror of what you're gonna see in your industry. But it's still, far less spread and change and movement and disasters than what we had before we had genomics. Net merit trend, genetic trend continues to take a huge increase in the last, since 2008, as more and more selection and pressure and more growth has happened in genomics. And this is the trend line for AI organizations, and right now, most of the AI companies 
are looking at the 75th percentile as their floor for how high the females and males are going to work with, particularly females. You're only going to look, work with the top quartile females. And young sire sales continue to go up, and they will continue to go up as there is more confidence in the data and the results that they see. Bottom line, dairy more want feed efficient, trouble-free cows, but we must reduce our input costs. That's what's going to affect our bottom line. That's what we control. Man, have things changed. We have a bull called Planet. He was 15 years old in March. Still in the stud at Select Sire, still working. That's a hell of a man. 15. When he got a proof, daughter data proof, he was the number one TPI bull in the breed and he was a total outcross bull. Man, we needed him. He was the easiest thing to sell. Big milk, calving ease, pretty good in components, outcross. We used him immediately when he got his daughter data as a sire father for sons who started making matings. Five years and 11 months later, his son Bookham was born. That's almost six years later. Bookham came out in 2009. When did genomics come out? 2008. We genomic tested him. He came out skyrocket high. We immediately, when he was a year old, started using him as a sire father for sons. A one-year-old. Less one year, nine months later, his son was born named McCutcheon. Came out genomically really high. We immediately used him for sons at a year old. Less than two years later, his son was born named King Boy. Genomically came out skyrocket high. Now the house of cards would have started crumbling if when he got daughter data proof, he fell, but he actually went up. And that helped him, and that helped him. What happened when he got his daughter data proof? If he would have not made it, the house of cards would start crumbling for him. But what happened to him? He went up. So now all three of these bulls are 99% reliabilities. Then we used his son as a year old for Cyrus Sons, and now we've already used his son for our sire sons. Six generations and soon to be seven. This has never happened in history anywhere around the world. This is amazing. It worked. But it created a new problem. What is that? He has sold almost 1.5 million doses of semen. And these guys have sold a lot of semen. Is he outcross anymore? No. Hell no. We got a new problem. He's got so much positive influence. So how do you handle that success rate? Well, we had to be creative. We came up with a program called Stratagen. And this is only a portion of our program just a small portion. But we created a planet line where any male that comes into that line has to be basically bred for, inbred for that line. And we have three other major lines and they have to be genomically virtually no relationship to the other three lines. So the portion of bulls that come in our program that are in the planet line, strategic strategy line, may be inbred to themselves, as long as it doesn't affect semen quality and fertility, that's okay. Why? Because what happens when we use them on the daughters of the other lines? No problem. But it's always going to be an on stro ongoing struggle as time to go on to maintain different lines but you've got to think outside of the box. 
Genomics can help us get there, but it can also help us solve our problems going forward. Dairy straight, I talked about that SUV. I'm a believer in it. For longer lasting high producing animals that maintain body condition through high production. Those are the cows that breed back. Those are the cows that don't lose their digital cushion. Skinny cows, lower DPR, more feet problems. Skinny cows are high maintenance, higher cost. This happened to be December 2016, the top 100 proven bulls in the, in the U.S. available. Those in yellow were the select sires bulls. We're kind of kicking butt. But again, it goes back to rank. They actually show the PTAs for each of the values in the rank. So what does everybody want to use? Number one and number two. Number one and number two. Number one and number two. And as you get, they get all that used. They become the seed stock in these herds that want to do all the IVF work. So then you have too few of sires being the grandfathers of all the maternal wine. And then you start reducing genetic pedigree variation. And then you have to solve future inbreeding problems. So I kind of wish instead of going to a rank, they would go to a percentile rank. You know, you might have 15, 20 bulls in the 99 percentile range. And they all get used that way. Rather than only sticking with number one, number two. And the same thing happens in the female world. Everybody wants to go out and buy number one. But five years later, with new traits, changing of, of, of data, new SNP effects, down the road maybe number 10 or number 20 will work on the future population you've got to breed. And that's what we need to be thinking about, what we're going to breed to the next generation. We select animals for both phenotypes and genotypes. So this is how, I'm, a, I'm the old school, I'm a cowboy. You know, I love great cows. I always have, I judge a lot of shows. So it was hard for me as a cowboy to transition to genetics and genomics. And, you know, I like to look at a cow and believe when I look at a cow that I really like, that's the cow I should get the bull out of. And many farmers are even that way. They flush this cow family in their herd because that's their favorite. And when DNA came out, genomics comes out, it might have said you're flushing the wrong cow family. That's the one you need to be flushing. I change, they change. As my six-year-old grandson said, and he's big on dinosaurs, I says, why don't we see dinosaurs today? And he says, they're extinct. I says, what does that mean? He says, they didn't adapt. He's six. He turned six Saturday. I missed his, yes, Saturday. I missed his, uh, yesterday. I missed his birthday party. He says they're extinct because they didn't adjust to their environment. I didn't want to become extinct, so I adjusted to my environment. But we can build a cow like this with the phenotypes and the genotypes. So when we started looking at DNA, if the genotypes, we looked at the cows that were the genotypes and the phenotypes said the same thing. Genotypes were really good, the phenotypes were good, that's the ones I worked with. If the phenotypes were good and the genotypes weren't, I stopped working with them. If the genotypes were good but the phenotypes were bad, I did not work with them. There was enough right on right to increase my odds. Old school, new school, I was trying to transition through this. What I believe and what I feel. So I worked with the genotypes. Best genotypes were the best phenotypes. I figure I'm a win-win. I can sleep at night, breed the kind of cattle I think most people want, and it turned out to be pretty successful. Man, has it changed. We used to use the best proven bulls as mating sires for sons on the great, best great cows. And, you know, back when I was selling semen, the most valuable time and semen price on a, on a bull was right after a great bull died at Skyrock. Today, you know, the most valuable time of semen on a bull's life is first collection on a high bull. 
Because his influence through sons and daughters is going to be amazing. When do we get semen out of a bull? A young calf? The moment they see the twinkle in his eye. <laughs> they go after it. They, they have a watch. They keep an eye on it. If we can get it, we get it. <laughs> Females? Eight, ten, nine months. Now some leopards got to lay three and four months. Remember we had changed that generation interval from almost six years down to one year nine. We're going to get it to one and a half. Biologically at this time, that's about as close as we can get. Where am I doing on time? Got about 10, 10 or so minutes. Okay. So things have definitely changed. We have definitely sped up generation. So what have we learned? Genomics can help you achieve your breeding goals. I don't care what kind of a breeder you are. If you're a show type, the type breeders in the Holstein were the last believers. They felt if the phenotype of the cow wasn't great, it couldn't make a good offspring. They always wanted to use the high type bulls, proven bulls, which was fine. Pretty predictable, pretty reliable, and still are today. But one thing they got tired of, great type cows that don't breed back. And there were a couple of bulls that made a lot of great type cows, but infertile cows. You know, a great type cow that wins this year, you know what they do with her next year? If she's not bred back, they don't show her. And now today, they have become believers. And what are they going after? The hottest thing in our show type market is our highest genomic bulls that are positive on daughter pregnancy rate. They are the hottest ticket in our show market. But they have become believers. Registered breeders that produce seed stock are believers. They create the seed stock for males and females, the market embryos. They are our lifeline. And the commercial herds have really adapted and are more and more adapted to genomics for management tools, inbreeding control, and mating programs. Tremendous buy-in, and that's where the acceptance is coming in the marketplace. Know the strengths and weaknesses of your breed. So select to maximize improvement of, of weak traits and maintain the key traits that made you great. Total index is helpful to sort a top group of bulls, but don't focus only on the top few. Spread your risk. Focus on traits to improve and use the animals in the top quartile. An example in Holsteins. If you look at the top quartile of bulls for milk production and rank them, that number one, number two at the end of the day when they get to proofs may not be number one or number two for milk, but they will be a milk bull. If you're looking to improve uh, protein percent or something like that, look for the highest quartile bulls for protein percent. They may not be that exact same thing when they get their daughter data proof, but they will be good protein percent bulls. Or great rear udder bulls. Or low somatic cell. You can guarantee that if they're in the top quartile, that's the kind of bull they will be when the daughter data comes in. Obviously, Semitols are very famous for their growth, their yield grade, and for their milk. You know where your strengths are. Genetics and genomics will help you maintain those strengths. At the same time, they will help you address maybe the things you'd like to improve. Maybe your stability, maybe your calving ease and maternal and direct ease, and your marbling. They can help you get there. You can have your cake and eat it too. You can accomplish both. It takes time. The power of the predictor group will determine the accuracy of your proofs. Grow it as fast as you possibly can. If you can grow it through the females, there's going to be a lot more females available in the population than males to do. Do it. And do it now. You will grab growing pains. You will make mistakes. Right away, the first genomic data came out. When those bulls got the proof, some of those failed. And the Doubting Thomases pointed them out right away. But there were less failures than before genomics. You'll make mistakes, but you'll learn from them. You'll increase inbreeding. You will use genomics to manage it. 
But don't focus so much on an elite few, and that will also help manage it. The highest, youngest generation are your future. They are your future. Genetic selection gives us foresight instead of high sight to predict traits that are difficult, like cavities, mastitis, productive life, and prevent future disasters like that bullet told you earlier about. They melt, they look great, but they don't read back. If we can prevent disasters, we are making progress forward. Better identification identifies genetics and removes non-heritable bias traits and also corrects the data that's in there that's wrong. Mis-ID, misparented. The highest quartile animals will be strong in that trait. Genomics now, genomics now proven results have convinced dairymen that the value of genetics is their future that are dairy's bottom line. They have turned that corner. They are part of the believers now. New cow families and new sire families will surface and some of the popular ones will fade away. So back to life. The early adapters will benefit the most in future markets. Closing. I read that sire December 31st. Select Sires was one of the, er the earliest adapters to genomics, dairy genomics, and it has paid dividends. The last sire summaries we had in December before I retired, Select Sires, the top 100 TPI proven bulls being marketed in the U.S., we had 42 of the top 100, our next competitor, competitor had 15. The top 100 genomic active AI bulls, we had 50, our next, next comparator had 13. Look at net merit, we had 30 of the top 100, next net merit uh, stud had 21 on the proven sires. And on genomic bulls, we had 43, our next nearest competitor had 20. We were adapters and it was paid dividends. Don't forget, somebody made the comment the other day, like last night's meeting. Do we forget everything that dad and grandpa told us? Absolutely not. You don't forget everything we've learned about breeding cattle in the last 40 years. You just add to your knowledge and understanding. And you temper how you're going to implement it going forward. That's how you make your gains. Because if you forget what you've learned in the past, you're going to make some stupid mistakes going forward. Add proving technology to make even faster genetic progress in the hard to change traits. That cow of the future will be more productive, more feed efficient, have dairy strength, more fertility, more trouble free, a longer lasting cow with helps you very bottom line. We made light years genetic progress in my career. We've made more progress to help our dairymen and our producers and make more profit, profitable cattle and more profitable herds in the last five than we did in my first 35. And you are just getting started. You can change a cow, improve the generation one by one. You can change your herd one by one. So with that, I say thank you. Right on time. Thank you very much, Charlie. We've got a couple minutes for questions. Um, like I said, Charlie's really balanced on all, all sides of uh, his industry. And, and actually, Charlie will tell you, since he's retired, he's spent a heck of a lot more time with uh, beef cow herds. I've uh, spent almost all my time since January 1st with beef cattle. <laughs> my best friend, my neighbor, they farm a lot of land. We planted 3,500 acres of corn and beans this year. I helped them work ground. He also has an 1,800-acre ranch in eastern Ohio. We run about 850 cattle out there. And I go out there with four-wheelers, and we round them up with, get them in the chutes to vaccinate, worm, tag them, fly tag them, etc. And I've learned a tremendous amount of appreciation and learned a lot about beef cattle. And, uh, and my buddy, he says, I want a, at least a quarter centimetal in every calf that comes on my place. That says a lot. I'm impressed. And he sells directly to Whole Foods. 
So he's kind of bat bypassing the middleman. So he's thinking, he's efficient, and he knows how to manage it. Well, we do use heterosis, obviously. And what's interesting, there's been a lot of different crosses done in the past in some of the herds that when, when production was here, but fertility was here, dairies looked for ways to solve that. So there was a lot of crosses done over the decades with a lot of the Swedish Reds, uh, some European uh, programs like that. And it really took off. And after the first generation cross, it really started slowing down and kept going down and kept going down and subsequent go down different generations. And now you don't see very little of that. The bigger crosses was a few years ago. They switched instead of doing that, they decided to bring their Holsteins to Jerseys. There was a big wave in California especially did that. Bring their Holsteins to Jerseys. That's the future. And one of the reasons there was water usage. Smaller cow require less water. Less manure, less issues on that end. There's a lot of that crosses going on. Then all of a sudden, you know, Jersey's registering all of these crosses. And now there's bulls getting being sampled out of these pedigrees. Now we're getting genetic evaluations and there's some bulls that are just skyrocket high in the Jersey lineup. And every one of sing, every single solitary one of the males that came out skyrocket high had what breed in them? Holstein. And now we see a big movement of Jersey herds outside of California breeding their jerseys to Holstein. How things change. Yeah. However, now CDBC and USDA has to figure out and solve some of the equations that you guys have to deal with every day. And that's crossbreeding. And now they have to back figure and back solve, and they're going to have those evaluations this year where they adjust for inbreeding regression, regress proofs based on inbreeding, but then they also add in heterosis effects. So now they got to have to reestimate where's this heterosis, at which, how much adjustment, and which breed is making the genetic contribution to this and this. And am I overestimating heterosis with this sire combination, or am I underestimating it with this breed combination? So they have to ball back solve new solutions to new problems that it's created. Remember, time changes everything. The uh, you mentioned the inbreeding and, and how you're managing that through the mating services and such to reduce to reduce inbreeding. Do you think that's going to be a function that needs to be taken over by the studs, by the breed associations, by the genetic uh, processors? Well, there are, each of the studs have their own main programs available, and so they're already up and running and alive. But then there are some outside the studs that are also available to do mating programs. Nobody's so, doing pardon me. Nobody's doing it will come. It will come. Yeah, it will come. The platforms are, are built so it, it can be transitioned. Uh, you give the uh, results of the Jersey Holstein F1s and back crosses and indicated that that might not be the best uh, uh, policy. Gentlemen, you just, you just identified exactly what the Simmental breed is today. Less than 31% of the Simmentals that are registered are purebreds. Yeah, that, there's no doubt that the large dairies in the future, it's going to be a composite breed. That's another way of so, so solving some of your inbreeding things, bring in different breeds. But I'm a true believer in this. Genomics will help the breeds that will be s still there to be part of the composites. And those that don't adapt to it will no longer be there to be a part of the composites. That I am truly real. What does that mean to the average size of the whole seed cow over the last 20 years? Well, the average size had been going like this. 
And then when the data on productive life was very obvious that too big was too big. And so the selection, and that's where genomics has helped really come in, uh, the selection is for the moderate sized cow. And in the weight in the productive life index is pretty negative for stature. So the calves with high productive life that come in the studs definitely are not tall. Now my experience, Anytime we take any biological trait to an extreme, you pay a price. I'll give you an example. If you get a, a dairy cow too strong, what happens? You lose the milk. You get them too frail, what happens? I told you, medical bills. You get them too tall, you lose functionality. You lose efficiencies. But then you have this segment that want to just drive them down to a jersey. But we've also now learned through the jersey Holstein process. You put the milk gene of a Holstein, high Holstein milk bull on a jersey cow and you get a calf. You calf her in. She's this tall and she wants to milk 150 pounds a day. Where's that udder? You can't get it in the milking parlor. Or what, and this is the biggest problem you have an udder that doesn't hold the center support and the teeth go out. You gotta think, common sense. We definitely don't need this. We definitely know that. But for those that only want to take them down to the size of Jersey, you're wrong. If you do that, you just stay with Jerseys. It's gotta be somewhere in between. And now the data, we have the genomic data, we can identify stature, it is the number one heritable trait. You can measure that and change a breed faster than one just like that if you want. But decades ago, we didn't look at those traits. We paid attention to the traits that were important. Milk, fat, protein, type. And when uh, commercial dairies were always having to buy heifers every year because of call rates, what do they buy when they go to the heifer lot? They go to a herd to buy a group of heifers. I want that big one, that one, big one, that big one, that big one, that big one. They sell like hotcakes. They, why? Because they outgrow everything else, so they're going to milk better. Made sense. Now those incentives are gone. It's changed the mindset of people. They think differently. They manage differently. They breed differently. But I'm a believer we don't need this, but I'm a believer we don't need this either in the Holstein breed. Did you change size in the Semitol breed? I remember that in an uh, earlier uh, discussion today. <laughs> you went from this up. We went from this down. So. Thank you, uh, Charlie. It was good meeting yesterday out at the office. I'm Bruce Holmquist with the Canadian Semitol Association. And I don't know a lot about the dairy industry. I know three things, I guess. I like milk. I like it better when it's made into cheese or yogurt. And I do not like supply management. <laughs> the, the thing that I've, I've had, uh, been privileged to have happen is, is be president of the World Semitol Federation. And that allowed me to uh, travel throughout the world and see dairy production and beef production in different parts of the world. And really the Angus and, and Holstein dominance that we see in North America isn't shared throughout the world. The Semitol uh, breed, or Fleckby as they're called in parts of Europe, uh, really do contribute to, to uh, not only milk, but dual purpose and meat production. And I just wanted to mention one, one thing that a lot of us don't know, and, and, and your presentation brought to mind the, uh, the things that we do share in common between dairy and beef production. And Kevin Good from Cattle Facts was at a, a seminar I was at last week, and he said that the uh, world cow herd has increased by 3%, or 13.7 million, in the last 18 years. That's not counting water buffalo. Beef cows have decreased by 3%, or 5.4 million head. Dairy cows have increased by 8%, or 19 million head worldwide. So we're seeing more beef come from dairy production. 
and, and the byproduct of that. And so, I mean, that certainly uh, factors into what you said about that bottom quartile being bred to, to beef herds. Now for my question. What I don't get, and, and you talk about the efficiencies that, that, need, that can be gained by reducing production costs. We all know one of our highest costs is raising replacement females. How is that so different in the dairy herds when we hear of such a, a short lifespan or lactation interval, interval in those cows? <clears throat> well, obviously we try to maintain uh, genetically improved longevity, and we have. We made significant gains. The goal would be to maybe get three lactations. We're a little less than that now. But if we get three lactations, what happens after the third lactation, you're actually, your health care costs go up with age. And if the simultaneously, if the next generation of replacement efforts come in at a jet lower genetic level, you lose, you lose some gain there. So it's a give and it's a take at the end of the day. To max, for those that want to keep cows to last five to six, seven lactations, sounds good. But they make their peak milk about third lactation. Fourth lactation, the peak milk or total milk is less. Usually fifth lactation, it's even less. And as that downward curve goes down, your medical cost of maintaining that animal go up. So then your margins start going down. And nobody's gonna keep building barns, adding more females. So what are you gonna do with the next generation? You don't wanna call them. You don't wanna call them. So where's the culling's gotta take place? On the other age basis, if it's voluntary culling. You have your involuntary culling, you can't change. But your voluntarily culling, you can, and that's always gonna be on the older animals because you're gonna lose potential genetic progress for your next set of replacements because they're already five, six years old. They're third generation back genetically, plus their higher maintenance cost and their total milk production per year is already gonna start trending down. So it's gonna be a trade-off, so you gotta see where those cross, and that's kind of where your goal needs to be. Okay. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, appreciate it. Here's a look on behalf of the Civitol Association. Appreciate your uh, input on how the dairy world is adapted with genomics. Thank you. Thank you.